Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's nice to be here up in the front. I haven't done this in a long time. Um, I'd like to have us join together in the response call to responsive call to worship. So I'll begin, and then if you would please join me. Come, let us celebrate the forgiving, reconciling love of God. For once we were lost and felt so far away. Now we have been found and welcomed home. Know that God's love is lavished upon you forever. We rejoice at the news of forgiveness and hope. Come, let us celebrate and praise the God of love. Amen. Now we'll join in the hymn 542, found in your red hymnal, Near to the Heart of God. It does not matter how far you have strayed, God will come looking for you. But how much better to recognize the error, error of our ways and head towards home. God stands in the road with open arms. Let us join together in our prayer confession. God, you know what we don't even know. We don't know where every dime went, but somehow you know what we did with all that we had last year and the year before that. You don't forbid us from having joy in our possessions. In fact, you delight in having joy for us. But what you know is that just acquiring more and more stuff isn't where we find joy. Lord, forgive us for being wasteful. 
for being prodigals. Forgive us for leveraging our future in order to have pleasure in the present. And help us to be good managers of the talents you've given to us. Help us to be generous and willing to share, kingdom-minded and focused on accomplishing your purposes for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. What woman having 10 coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep at the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Believe the good news of the gospel. We were lost, but now we're found. Amen. Let us end this up. to be able to do that again? Yeah. It really is. Um, I'd like you to please join me in the prayer for illumina illumination. We'll be saying it in unison. Let's begin. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first scripture reading for today is Proverbs 21, verse 5, and 21, verse 20. I'd like us to read this in unison as well. Let's begin. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to want. Precious treasure remains in the house of the wise, but the fool devours it. Amen. And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. 
Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What jumped out at me as I was reading that, and I and, and in my head I wish I had read it differently, but when he came to himself, right? Let, again, let's join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every three years, uh, pastors are expected to do boundary training to help uh, prevent sexual misconduct in the church. And the training has changed a lot over the years. Years ago, it was, it was a basically a list of cover your butt things to do so that you can never be accused of anything. Right? Do this list and you should be okay. Right? Make sure that there's a window in your office. Never meet with anybody in the church by yourself. All those things. Now, in more recent years, they, they're like, you know, this training isn't going to do anything for somebody who's a predator, right? So let's, let's, it's more geared for preventing sexual misconduct and the idea of not for pastors not to have affairs. And what's fascinating, and I had never thought about this, they said just for, for clergy, if they have an affair, it's not just they could lose their marriage and, and, and strain the relationships in their family. They lose their job. You lose your means of providing for yourself. You can lose everything. There's so much at risk. And then they have interviewed and asked clergy who have, you know, who have fallen to temptation, right? What happened? And you know what their answer is? I don't know. That, I, I, it just happened. I don't know. So now the training is pay attention to your life. <laughs> the, to, this is just like accenting. The Holy Spirit is going, yes, with everybody. Yes, amen. All right. Uh, pay attention to your life. And we start getting, we're asking, you know, because a whole centered, grounded person is paying attention to their life and they're not, it, things just don't happen, right? So, so boundary training now asks you questions like, are you exercising regularly? Are you eating well? Do you take your day off? Do you take all of your vacation? What do you do for fun? Do you have a date night with your spouse? Do you have friends outside of the church? Pay attention to your life. And by the way, I, I coach other pastors. I'm asking that question. But when we went into COVID, it all turned into self-care. It all turned into, what are you doing to be okay? What are you doing to, for yourself? What are you doing to stay sane? What are you doing? So we are in part two of a sermon series. Uh, it's a, our stewardship series. And it's, uh, it's called Enough, Cultivating Joy Through Simplicity and Generosity. And today's uh, sermon title is Wisdom and Finances, Finances and Wisdom. And it's basically pay attention to your life. Pay attention to the choices that you are making. Pay attention to your finances. Uh, let's talk about two different parables. First, the one from scripture about the prodigal son. Only recently, uh, in recent years, did I learn what the word prodigal means. I had always assumed that it meant rebellious or some, I think, uh, I read that some people assume that it meant somebody who gets lost, wanders away. It actually means somebody who is a spendthrift, somebody who just wastes their money. That's the prodigal son. And in, and in the story that we're meant to learn from, it uh, goes and spends everything and then he comes to himself. And he realizes, you know, the servants in my, in my father's house are in a better position than I am. Let me go home and ask for mercy, right? Last week, we were talking about ways that we enslave ourselves. 
And are we making the decisions that lead to freedom or and slavery, becoming slaves to the bank? So let me tell you a modern parable. Years ago, I went to a PW, a Presbyterian Women Christmas party, and Jane Ulick, God bless you, Jane. Jane is now with the saints. So it's my soul sister. She came up with this, with this game. She took the, uh, the flyer from the Sunday paper from the local shop right, and she picked out seven items, and then we all had to guess how much they cost on sale. How, how much they cost, and then at the end of it, whoever came closest to the actual retail price would win the game. Right. So the conversation at my table was, I don't even look, or I know what I like, so I just grab those things. I you know, I'm, I'm not going to win this game. And the two women who came within pennies of, of, the, of the total were the two poorest women in the room. And I have never forgotten that. They knew what everything cost because they had to. Studies have shown that the more people make, the more, people, the more money that they waste. And that's why we call it disposable income. So with the idea of being more, attention, more intentional, paying attention, we can make choices that, that, that free us or enslave us. Now, I want to say this. Last year at the church that I was serving, we did the stewardship campaign. And the stewardship elder, after you, know, you get all the, the cards back, and, you know, and every year there's the call to all the usual suspects, right, to say, you know, hey, can we count on, on your giving for the year? And he reported back to the session nearly in tears that because of COVID, there were people who had no income since March. I'm gonna be talking about tithing in, in, in the coming weeks. Tithing is when you give your first fruits to God, you know, you, that your 10% um, from the beginning, and then you set your family's budget ap- after that, you've done that. Um, 10% of nothing is nothing. Right. And um, and this talk, none of this is meant to slap any hands or there, there is absolutely no admission price to be part of this, this fellowship, to be part of this worshiping community. None. Um, I always say to folks, you know, if, if you've got nothing to give, don't stay away. Please don't stay away. Um, I know from personal experience that if unemployment should hit your home, you know, there's a pause button. That's it on your giving. Well, and the first bill to get paid is your mortgage. Absolutely get it. While you figure out who's who and what's what. Absolutely understandable. So we're going to be having these conversations, but with the understanding, you know, this is a personal conversation. All of this is meant to help free us, not, not for us to, there's no guilt trip here. There's no, you know, there's no punishing God ready to slap our hands or anything like that. We are making... All of this is so that we pay attention to our lives and we are making choices that, that can free us so that we might know peace, so that we might sleep at night, that we might know simplicity and joy. And you can ignore everything that I'm saying and that's fine, but all of this is offered in a spirit of love to help build us up and free us from all that, from all, because the world will tell us that we need this, 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 and this to be happy, and it's a lie. <laughs> So looking at our lives, looking for what is, what is a lie and what is truth, that is what all is about. And again, this is very personal. This is between you and God. And all of these lessons are not meant to be start suddenly looking at other people like this. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I have a friend uh, who I grew up with, and she is a social worker. And she does not have a lot of money. And she... And she posted this on, you know, on Facebook years ago. The one thing that she does for herself is get her nails done. It's her one indulgence, but it makes her feel human, right? And it's a good reminder that everybody needs something so that they don't feel like they're deprived all the time. And, and I remember, why do I remember that? Because I have been in the food pantry with, 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 with the ladies and, and, and where somebody says, did you see her nails? Hmm. 
And here's another conversation. I got lots of stories this morning. Uh, here's another story. A woman came into my office from having come from the food pantry. And 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 I just want to say food pantry, that type, that type of ministry, everyone, sometimes people need to take a sabbatical because it, you, people can get salary. But this woman comes into my office, Pastor Robin, can I talk with you? Sure, absolutely. She's like, can I tell you about this, this coat? She was wearing a leather coat. She goes, before I became an alcoholic and a drug addict, I was a successful businesswoman. And this coat is the only thing that I have left from that life. And darn if I'm going to be judged by those ladies because I have one nice thing. Am I not allowed one nice thing? Sorry. Right? And, you know, so grace, 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 and then go talk with the ladies. <laughs> right? So let's not waste time this morning worrying about whether this is, you know, whether this can be universally applied or whether we can think of exceptions for the rule. This, you know, and, and therefore it doesn't apply to us. It, all of this is being offered up in love so that we might know freedom and peace. Pay attention to your life. Pay attention to the choices you are making. Look at your bank statement at the end of the month. Look at your credit card bill at the end of the month, and it will tell you a story. It will tell you what your values and your priorities are. Another story. A friend of mine, her brother, is having a business dinner, and at the end he pulls out his credit card, and it gets declined. And he was embarrassed. And he's like, oh my gosh, somebody must have, have gotten the number. Let me, let me call. Call American Express. And the person on the other side of the line said, it's your wife. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, I know. Uh, he goes, we pay off our credit card bills at the end of the month. And please cancel the card. And the person said, I will do that for you. I will cancel the card. But I'm telling you, it's your wife. Well, come to find out. You know how you get those solicitations, transfer your balance and 0% for, for so long. Yeah. Do you know how many of those you can open? Yeah. And that's what she'd been doing. And I would like to say, you know, I would love to say that it was a wake up call for her. My best friend did the same thing to her husband and they're, you know, this is just what women do. The lies we tell ourselves. Some people, should not have credit cards and don't feel don't everybody 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 has something that can be their undoing you will hear me say that a lot everybody has something for some people it's the credit card that it's just not healthy for you the same way some people can't handle alcohol some people cannot handle having a credit card some cut it up some people need to be cash on the barrel another story Mabel, not a real name, uh, sat down with her one time. This is somebody, a QVC, Home Shopping Network person, somebody who is known to say, I just had to have it. I saw it and I just had to have it. Um, and I always wondered, how did she do that? I mean, her husband must have left her some kind of pension. Oh, my gosh, right? Sat down with her one time and she told me I had to cut up the credit cards. And that she had gotten to the point where she was just able to do the minimum payments and had to uh, eat some humble pie and talk to her daughter and say, help. And the daughter helped, but it, it also meant cutting up the credit cards. And this is what I remember. It was like talking with somebody who got sober after 30 years, right? Some people cut them up. And um, in, these, in the resources that, that I'm using for this, it's like that I had never heard of this. Uh, there's some folks, and, and maybe some of you do this, you organize yourself by putting money in envelopes, right? This is the money for the groceries for the week. This is the money for the clothes for the week or for the month. These are the money for, the, for gas. This is the money for you know, all of that. And that's the way to do it. So that's, that's, your, that's how they budget, right? And, and I 
shared this years ago and this woman came up to me and said, oh my gosh, Robin, I've been doing that for years. And it's the only way that I could stay married, <laughs> right? Because, because, you know, everything she was with my husband, he can't have her credit card. So honey, here's the money for you to go out with your friends. And when that money is gone, that's it. Right. She, so, so it kept us out of the poorhouse and kept us, you know, kept us happy, kept us honest. Right. So if you look at your expenses at the end of the month, it will tell you, tell you stories. There's two things that usually get us. One is impulse buys. So the, to ask to pause, again, hit the pause button and say, uh, wait, wait 24 hours, wait a week. Are you still thinking about that thing to, you know, do the whole question, you know, treating yourself every once in a while is, is fine. But if you're putting yourself in the poorhouse because of that impulse, you know, learn to, to pause. And the other thing that, that um, also undoes people is eating out. Now, of course, COVID shifted all of that. Um, it, before COVID, people were eating out uh, on average six times. Um, and that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So it's not dinner every night. Although I, I have those friends who, who don't cook at all. Uh, but, the, you know, but six times. But it, because of COVID, it was affected. Now, this is... Uh, this I find fascinating. I read an article that says the benefits of home cooking is healthier to cook ourselves. Um, it's also, you know, if you're living with a family to have the, the, the family time around the table, it's better for your family to be sitting around a, a table together. Uh, but this, this fun fact kills me. If you entertain and have a dinner and you serve a vegetable, people will think you're a better cook and they will think you're a better person. I just think that's hysterical. I was raised by a home ec teacher. What do you mean? People are not serving vegetables, <laughs> right? You are a better person if you're, if you're serving vegetables. I think that's hysterical. So all of this is interesting, but let me highlight that this is spiritual work. How we live our lives, every decision, you know, people want to relegate spirituality to just like a corner of your life. No, it, it, it encompasses everything. How we treat other people is, is based on your faith and your spirituality. How you treat other people when you're in your car <laughs> is a spiritual decision. When you're angry, you know, how do you react, you know? I, I joke now. I'm just like, darn it, they're making me pray for them. Shoot, you know, because I'm working on that, right? So, I mean, but every decision that you make is a spiritual decision. So how you, the use of your finances is a spiritual decision. It's an expression of our belief system. Quoting uh, Pastor Adam Hamilton, we are to use our resources to help care for our families and others, to serve Christ and the world through the church, mission, and everyday opportunities. We have a life purpose that is greater than our own self-interest. And how we spend our God-given resources reflects our understanding and commitment to this life purpose or mission. You know, all that we have, we believe, comes from God. And with discernment, looking to God, is how we spend. So you go to your doctor once a year for your annual you should go to your doctor once a year for your annual, right? <laughs> this is your annual at church reminding all of us to pay attention. Pay attention to your life. Pay attention to your finances. Do a tune-up if necessary. But ask yourself the question, does your spending support God's values or those of the culture? And again, the culture will tell us that our, our job is to consume and can make as much money as possible, possible to blow as much money as possible, and the one with the most toys at the end wins. Living simply so that we can be more generous is countercultural and ultimately a blessing because getting to help other people from our abundance gives joy. So um, I don't know the last time you did it. But I encourage you to sit down and have that reality check and remember simplicity and generosity lead to joy. Studies have shown and the faithful can witness in Jesus name. Amen. 
you are invited to stand in body or in spirit to sing Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, which is number 522 in your red hymnal. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is a story from my childhood, and it had a great influence on me. Of course, I didn't know that it did until I became an adult, and then I realized that it all started when I was five or six, maybe seven years old. I learned about joy of giving at home, watching my parents. 
My father was a pastor several of several very small rural and financially poor churches on the then outskirts of San Antonio, Texas. Sundays were a very special day to me as a child because going to church meant uh, seeing friends and socializing with the children of my age, hearing my mom play the hymns, and of course, singing at the top of my lungs. I don't sing well, but I do with enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> After services, people would linger and socialize. For a child, it all seemed like a very festive occasion. And I never noticed that we were just as poor as the congregation. Upon arriving at home, my mom and my grandmother, my abuela, would prepare our Sunday meal, usually for the 10 of us. Never noticed that, uh, excuse me, usually for the 10 of us. But on Sundays, they always cooked extra. They knew that someone would show up at the door often a whole family, and we never knew who or how many. But my daddy would always say, welcome, you're just in time for dinner. We're so pleased that you can join us. As though they had been expected. Always beans and whatever was growing in the back garden, the meal actually became a fiesta and fun. Of course, I had no idea how much effort it was for my parents to feed those extra mouths. They shared whatever was available with smiles and joy and received heaps of blessings in return. We were never, ever hungry. I know that your giving of money and time and effort will be as fulfilling to you as it was for them. Thank you. Now is the time for the folks at home to um, and for everyone. We're not. Uh, we we are going to be passing the place in the coming weeks, but not quite yet. Um, but thank you for your generosity. And again, it's not just it, finances help, but uh, there's. Time, talent, gifts, all of that, everything is very much appreciated. And let's use this time to, to spiritually think um, and in gratitude for all that God has given us.
for meeting our needs so far as individuals, as, as a church. And Father, help us not miss out on the feast that you are preparing. And help us out of your abundance to give, whether it's a widow, widow's might or a millionaire's check. Help us all enter into that great potluck that you are creating so that we can all sit down and feast together and find not only are we fed, but there's so much left over. So bless us and keep us and take all that we graciously put back into your hands, having just recently received it from you and help us receive it with joy. And we pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. And we'll actually continue in prayer. So you may be seated. So God of grace, God who, when we think we're going to be punished, you run out ahead and intercept us on the way. We, we, we know you as this God. Remind us. Because we, we need to give up, help us give up our vision of you with a bunch of thunderbolts, lightning bolts waiting to zing us for things that we have done or left undone. So we come knowing that, but we want to remember again and again, help us remind each other your true nature is of that father who hoists up his skirt so he can run so fast to get to us and embrace us. And so as we come today, we bring, we, we look back and we see the footsteps all, all these footsteps behind us on, a, on this journey that you have called us out onto the road. You, you, you started us um, by giving us life. And then at some point for each of us, you convinced us we were blind. Whether we knew it or not, and then your grace made us see. And so we thank you so much for the grace that each one of us has been touched by so that we could be no longer alone or afraid. And that we could look at dangers with courage, the dangers that did not overcome us because of your grace. So make us so mindful when we see new dangers that we've already walked through so many because you've walked with us and that we were not overcome. And help us to remember so many who we love who face these dangers without your grace or without knowing or seeing your grace. We, we thank you that we can intercede on their behalf. We thank you for the forgiveness that not only you have offered us, but that others have offered to us when we've squandered our gifts, when we have been prodigals. And we thank you for the many ways your grace continues to appear in our lives. We, we wanna join um, the gratitude of Jackie, Jackie having her healing and for the, for bringing us children. Like we've been asking for, for, for children, but you brought them to us in such a beautiful way. And for Jody's teaching them. We thank you also for our nurses as we see a worldwide shortage of these precious caregivers. We just thank you for the ones in our midst, and we ask that you would truly overwhelm them with your grace. And Father, there are so many that travel in our backpack of love that we bring in every single week. So we want to say their names. We want to speak them aloud or in our own hearts. We, we, we bring them to our minds because some of them are in danger and they can't see the danger. Some of them are like younger brothers who haven't come to their senses yet. And so we offer them to you, asking that you run out and meet them in the road. And there's, there's those in our midst who actually face dangers that they see only too well. But no one looks around and gives them, and gives them anything. That's how they feel. They're, they're sick, they're aging. There's money struggles, there's job struggles. 
Father, we ask that you would graciously run out and, and, and embrace them and help us do the same when we see them in our midst. We ask particularly that you would be so gracious to Dorothy and Ken, Mercedes and Gail, Ruth and Paul, Carol, Stefan and Will, Paul and Yvonne's mom, Nancy and Jessica. And Lord, in this moment, we, we speak aloud or speak to you in our hearts, the names of those people that we so want you to pour out amazing grace on. We particularly lift up Nicole Neesmith and her family after another COVID death. So Lord, here we are. You've brought us all here. And each one of us is like a little river who's flown into this place, into this time. And we're like a reservoir of living water that's just all stored up to be grace for our neighbors and for our world. And so just encourage us, give us discernment. Where are the thirsty and the hungry in our midst? And help us to be meeting these needs. Spirit, let us see. Let us hear the cries that need, that are desperately crying for help. And then show us how much is left over once we give. And so bless us, convict us, use us over and over. Bless us, convict us, and use us. Use all that we have. And then send us out, your disciples of today. Pray in the same prayer that we need to pray so much. And we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our brothers. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we're going to, in a sense, continue in prayer as we sing, we stand and we sing about God's amazing grace.
Eat well. Eat your veggies. Be gracious. Be mindful. Invite God into every corner of your life. Try to glorify God in every corner of your life. And know that we worship a gracious, loving God who will run down the road to meet us. And we'll be with there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun. Anyway, <laughs> go knowing that the God who knit you together in your mother's womb would die for you and did in the person of Jesus Christ, but rose again and is with us in power and spirit this day and forevermore. Let us go in peace. In Jesus' name, amen.